Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. So what are Keras embedding layers? This is another layer type that you can use in Keras, but what do they do? They're used with natural language processing. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. Keras provides something called an embedding layer. These are very often used with natural language processing in Keras. However, they don't really have to be used just with NLP. Really, how I think of an embedding layer is almost an alternative to one-hot encoding. With one-hot encoding, you, or dummy variables, or whatever you want to call that, where you take a categorical value, so say you have a hundred different possibilities for that categorical value, now you need a way to encode that into, say, dummy variables, you're going to have a hundred dummy variables. That gets impractical if you deal with extremely large cardinalities for those categoricals particularly if you're dealing with words in the English language. Think about how you would dummy and code just English words. You would need one dummy variable for every English word that you had. Now, some of the options in Spacey could be useful for that. You could turn words into their stem words, like having could be transformed into have. That way you just have one of those to, to deal with. A lot of the verbs you could transform, like ran, you could always have it as run so that way you don't have two. Brought could always be bring, or bringing also going to the root word of brought. But those are, those are some of the things you can do to get that dimension down. But the embedding layer, you can actually learn an embedding layer for your words or whatever vocabulary or categorical you want to send it towards. Now this is most often used on sequences, the type that we would send into an LSTM or a temporal convolution neural network, but that also does not have to be the case. So let's look at a simple embedding layer. Now we're going to see that when we create an embedding layer, like here, and by the way, you can see another example of this back in our image captioning example, we made use of embedding and we loaded the glove embedding layer directly into it, but we didn't talk a lot about what the embedding layer actually did. It's all exactly like what you're going to see here. So now we're learning how to actually even train an embedding layer. So here we've defined this embedding layer and our input dimension count is going to be 10. So input dimension, that's essentially how many categories or how many words, what's your vocabulary size? If you were using one-hot encoding, you would have ended up with 10 dummy variables here. However, we're going to sort of dimension reduce this a little bit, not really a dimension reduction, but we're going to encode these into four number vectors rather than the 10 number vector that a dummy would normally have. And it's not zeros and ones. All of these four elements are going to be used in that vector. Now the input length, this is kind of interesting. This is essentially your sequence length if you're dealing with natural language processing. So in this case, we're just going to have two of these because this is a really, really simple example. And you'll notice this neural network, and I use the term loosely, only has one embedding layer. So this neural network is going to essentially just kick out the embedding directly to the output layer and you'll see it. I'm saying atom and mean square error, but that really doesn't matter. We're not going to train this very simple neural network that we're creating. I'll go ahead and run this and it doesn't really do anything other than define this model. Now, you should really think of the embedding layer as a lookup table. So we've got these 10 input dimensions and each of those 10 categorical values that you're going to pass in, each one of those will return a different unique set of four numbers from the output dimension. So this lookup table, you can th really think of it as 10 rows and four columns. It's a lookup table. That is all an embedding layer is, is a lookup table. We're going to go ahead and now run this. We're going to give it some input data. The input data is just going to be a little sequence here of one, two. One and two are both well within that input range and it is going to change these two input categoricals, these two integers. The input into these is always integer. So you're transforming your characters or your words. And this is most often used for words, less often for characters, though that doesn't have to be the case you transform, you always provide integers because they're basically lookups. These are essentially the rows in that weight matrix that is the embedding layer. And then we're going to request it to predict this and we're going to print out the shape of the input data and also the prediction that came back. Okay, the lookup table, 
you might have expected that to be all zeros because we never defined a lookup table. We never trained this neural network. So where are these numbers coming from? They're random initializations, essentially. So they're like the random weights that all layers of a neural network have. This doesn't really make a lot of sense until you actually look at the embedding weights. So if we look at the embedding weights, notice there's 10 rows and four columns. So these are the 10 vocabulary elements. And then we, we just requested that there be four of these. That four is arbitrary. We could have made that six or eight or 102. Wouldn't really matter. It's sort of a dimension reduction concept, though, though not exactly. Now what we're going to do, but again, along the lines of why I call it a dimension reduction, is because instead of having the 10 dummy variables you would have, now you have these four values. Now let's see what these weights actually mean. So this first one, that one, that corresponds to this very, very first column. And this whole thing, it can be thought of as a, as a column or dimension vector. Notice the 0 0.4763. Notice it is exactly the same vector as this one right here, the second one. This is row, assuming you count with zero as your starting number, 0, 1. This is 1. 2 is the next one. Negative 2, 7. 0, 2, 7. Look at that. It's just a lookup table. That's all the embedding layer really is. So the glove embeddings that we used in earlier in this class, that is essentially just a table for a large number of English words. I forget how many, and I think it had vector sizes of 200, if my memory serves. Don't quote me on that, but it had some arbitrary vector length for each of those glove embeddings. We just took that matrix and loaded it right into the weights. We called set weights on it. That's all we did. And we defined this embedding layer. Now, when you train that neural network, you want to mark those embedding weights as non-trainable. Otherwise, they'll start to get pulled away from the values that they were originally set at by whoever trained it. And if you're doing transfer learning, you probably don't want those weights modified. Well, see more about how to train these in a moment. Now I compared this to dummy variables. So usually what you want to do to prove that something is equivalent to something else is see if you can emulate that thing in something else. So we're going to use an embedding layer to basically provide dummy variables for us. So what I am doing here is I am creating an input dimension three. So that would be a categorical variable that had three possible values. The dummies for this would look like this, essentially the diagonal that you see with dummy variables, because dummies, just a briefly review, essentially one of the values is, is one or hot, that's why it's called one hot, and the rest are zero. And this is a simple way that you can encode categorical values. The output dimension is also going to be three because there's three columns in what we're encoding it to. If you're doing dummy variables, these will always be the same. And this is why dummy variables are so inefficient because say your input dimensions was 100, you had 100 categories, you could still make this very small. You wouldn't want to make it too small, but you could make it say four or eight and train for it. We'll see how we can do that in just a moment. Then input length, that's your sequence length. So that's how many of these you want to encode at a time. Then we're going to compile it with Adam and MSE. Again, we're going to never train this neural network, so these two really don't matter. But we're going to do set weights on the embedding layer. Now, we do have to transform this lookup up here into a list because you can potentially, I'm not going to really get into that, but you can, you can have multiple lookup matrices for this if it's going sort of in, in multiple directions. But that would be a more advanced setup. But you can refer to the Kira's documentation if you're interested in why exactly that is a list. Let's go ahead and run it. But for now, just always embed your matrix list and you'll be good to go. I'm going to go ahead and run that. Now we have created essentially our dummy emulator as an embedding layer. I'm going to go ahead and run it down here. We're going to encode these two categoricals and run it and essentially look what it's doing. There's the dummy variables. So you could put one of these on the front of your neural network and not even have to encode your dummy variables. There's better ways of going about it, but this is one way that you, you could do that. If you wanted to make your neural network truly so that you could pass in these integer values and have it automatically transform these into dummies. This is cool. You'll do this kind of thing a lot. This is when you want to use transfer learning 
to bring your dummy variables in. However, the real fun gets in, eh, maybe it's not the real fun, but you can train these yourself. And this is a great way to deal with if your neural network needs to take in a high dimension categorical that does not have an easy way that you can transform it into dummies. Say you have, I don't know, a 20,000 cardinality categorical, you could literally just define it as a embedding Pick some arbitrary number of dimensions, like, I don't know, 20, 40. It's a hyperparameter. You'd have to play with it. And literally, the atom update rule or backpropagation, all of them, it'll do gradient descent, and it will train your embeddings for you. Let's go ahead and see how we can do this. This uses some of the Cura's functions for natural language processing. This shows really how easily you can build these NLP neural networks now. So here are 10 restaurant reviews. The first ones are all bad. Never coming back. Horrible service. Rude waitress. Cold food. Horrible food. These other guys really liked it. Awesome. Awesome service. Rocks. Poor work. Couldn't have done better. So these are all just different different values that you can choose for this. And notice I put in random exclamation points and then even just a sort of random one that was more applying to, say, evaluating contractors. But noise is good. One means negative, zero is positive. So these are the labels. This is the why. We're gonna train a neural network on it. So we're gonna say our vocabulary size is 50. We can just pick that to be whatever the heck we want. We don't have to really count the number of words in there. And we're going to use the Kira's one hot. The Kira's one hot is kind of cool. It sort of scares me a little bit, but it's good for examples. It is basically going in there and tokenizing for you. So breaking these words into, breaking these sentences into words and then assigning each to an index. So it's doing a lot in the background. Normally, I like to have a little more control over that. I want to know how it's being tokenized and I would like to know how it is assigning these indexes to it, but this is good for, for an example. When we get into showing how to connect one of these to an API that others will use so, sort of in a production environment, we'll see that we really care about locking down what these index values are. I wouldn't want, if I'm, if I'm deploying this in a real world corporate situation, I wouldn't want coming to become an index of say five one time, retrain and now it's four, and potentially the data coming in is now encoded wrong. So you have to be careful with all of that. Then I am going to go ahead and go ahead and run this part. We're going to go ahead and run it and encode these. These are all of your sequences. We would like these to all be of consistent length because that's how sequences work. We're going to do the max length of four. Look at that, they're all nice and zero padded. Thank you, Keras. We're going to create a very simple sequential neural network. We are going to have one dense layer at the end. So there is learning going on in here. There is one weight matrix, but then we're also learning in the embedding layer. The neural network is going to actually learn how to create these embeddings so that they are a way that separate those words and map them into Euclidean space in a meaningful way. This saves you having to deal with tons and tons of dummy variables and creating a very complex neural network. Embeddings are great for NLP. Let's go ahead and run it. We'll print a summary. There you see it. Let's go ahead and fit it. I'm just running it for 100 epochs. Very, very fast to train. Let's look at essentially the embeddings. Each line is an embedding for a different word. I'm not even going to try to explain the rhyme or reason for this. They're essentially like weights that were calculated in the same way that the weights were for the actual layers. And there is one layer on here that's learning as well, but the embeddings learn right along with the other weights in the neural network. And then we can evaluate this neural network at the end. Accuracy is perfect, actually. The reason accuracy is perfect is I really didn't put any overlap here. All the words for negative reviews were not in the positive reviews. This is just a toy example. Thank you for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to look at end-to-end -end natural language processing. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.